I moved from Uganda at a very young age, grew up in England, went to school at a place called Cheltenham, very conservative English people, yes. And um, we had to learn English manners. We had to meet the queen, which I was very pri privileged to do. That, why am I telling you these things? Is because our experiences mold our lives. And I lived in France. I lived in France, Paris, France, at school. And so I got that experience too. I went back to England. And when I went back to England, finished my schooling, and started working in England, in London. I worked for a few, uni for a few companies. And I also worked for the Commonwealth Universities in London, England. Now, that job actually introduced me to wanting to work for the people, people of the world. We, our job was to find funding for universities in Africa. I want, to, I want to tell everybody what they need to do as Africans. You go to these foreign countries and you are so afraid, am I going to get a work permit? Am I going to get a scholarship to do what? Yes, you can. Just like Barack Hussein Obama said, yes, you can. And I did. I worked for um, Airbus Industry of North America, which is a French company that makes Airbuses. How did I work there? It was because I knew French. And then after that, I joined the United States government. I worked for Overseas Private Investment, which is a funding agency giving money out to develop for all countries except the United States. And I was working with very powerful people who were very rich, give, trying to make investments all over the world. Why am I telling you all these things? You will, you will know why. And after I did OPIC, I joined the IRS, which is Internal Revenue Service. I worked there for a while. And then eventually I worked for the National Science Foundation, which funds funding, all scientific funding for, except medical research. So when I was there, I was asked to help the agency with um, an initiative that was created for Africa. And um, I was very excited, so we, we worked hard and we, we, the government had given an, a grant of more than $300 million to be invested in material science in Africa. We did an initiation in Africa. We started in Nairobi and we signed on all the countries in Africa. How did we do that? I helped the agency to, f to find the ministries. They didn't have a clue of how to find the, agency, the agencies in Africa that can work with them to start this uh, initiative going. And I'm telling you about this because this is part of the giving your life to helping others. Um, when, when we came here as Americans, the American people, had not worked well, well, they hadn't worked a lot with, Ameri with Africans. And some of them didn't understand the accent, some of them didn't understand the ways things are done here. But we managed, we did it, we have an initiative that is going on up to now. We have students that we are, we are supporting. We have two meetings every other year supporting African scientists to do research in material science. And I'm very proud to say that I'm part of the, the group that actually um, helps these Africans. I mentor a few students to do their PhDs in material science. Um, but in, when I was living in the United States, or when I live in the United States, I need to tell you that it wasn't the easiest thing for me as an African to have been married and had a son and I wanted to read stories to my son, and I could not find books on Africa in any American library. So, and it was a must that we have to read books every night for these kids. So when I was sitting in the library, I said, you know what, I'm going to write some stories for my son, so he learns about Africa and blah, blah, blah. So that's how I started writing. That's why I was telling you this story. So I started writing by telling a story of this American child that was born half American and half African and had to take a journey to Africa to meet his or her African roots. So that's how this whole thing started. Then later on, I moved on to writing 
poems. Why did I write poems? I didn't have time. When you are working, I was working for the government, as they, they mentioned. There was no time. I would wake up at 6 o'clock, I'm on the train going to Washington, D.C. to work. Then you get on the train at, a, at around 5, you're going home. There's absolutely no time. So I used to write at night, and I used to write on the we during the weekends. So I did poems because I thought I should put stories of my experience in short form. So I wrote poems that were actually touching me, but I wasn't talking about me. They were talking about other people and experiences in a book of poems. And then later on, I said to my, I started to come and visit Uganda on a frequent, frequently. Um, I had no idea in my life that I would ever move back to Uganda. Why? Because when I first came to Uganda, you know what, what had gone on in Uganda. We had a mean, you had, I don't know what was going on. Then the first time I came when things were okay, there was so much dust, I got sick, and then, I, and then there was so much darkness. This, I'm telling you this to just tell you the mentality of a person who doesn't take things in perspective. I was like, no, I cannot live like that. I have to go back. But anyway, there's a long story in between there that I'm not going to tell you. But eventually I said, okay, let me go to Uganda and stay a month on vacation and see whether this is, whether really um, it is what I think it is. I came, I fell in love with Uganda. I did, and I'm still, I'm still in love with Uganda because I built a house for myself. Now, when I did that, before I moved over to Uganda, I started to write a story, and it is called The Virgin Journey. Um, why was I writing this virgin journey? I wanted people to know that Africans don't only read textbooks, go to university, get a, a master's degree, a PhD, and they work, and then they throw away the books. I wanted to start teaching Africans to read fun stories. Instead of you going to Aristoc, you buy all the European writers that are in there, or romantic books that are written by white people, and non-white people, yes, but none of the African people you are reading. Yes, we used to read, um, West Africa is very, way, way ahead of us writing stories. Um, and we, Uganda needs to be at the same level. We have so many stories. So I started off with a very funny story about a white man coming to Africa and hating Africa. And you know, as he hated Africa, he was of course getting experience in Africa, you know, all the things that go on here, eventually the guy falls in love with Africa. He didn't only fall in love with Africa, he fell in love with a beautiful lady like her, and he married that girl. The story goes on, the first story, the trilogy is the first book is in Kenya, uh, but then it also comes to Uganda. The second book is in Uganda, but it goes to, you, to Kenya and Tanzania. The third book is going to, is, I'm writing the third book, and it is mainly in Tanzania, but it also involves Uganda. It's a love story between Africans and, and Europeans and non-Ugandan non or non-African people. It is a fantastic love story. When you touch, they start reading it, you can't put it down because Africans are very scared, scared to talk about romance. They don't want to talk about, I love you. They never want to say, oh, I feel so good when you touch me. So it is, uh, it is taboo. So that is what I'm doing. So why, why am I telling you this? Because we have to write. We have to write stories that are at heart so that our children will learn about us. Our children will learn about our country. Our children will learn about the, the history of our country. And they will learn about the nice things that exist in this beautiful continent of Africa. We are not selling ourselves enough. We are looking at Europe. We are looking at United States to aid us. We have so much. And everything we have, we can write about. You can look at that grass there. They call it Pasperum, Pasperum something Pasperum. You can write a love story about that grass. How? The people from Chigezi, I was told about these people from Chigezi that they, were, they used to get sick by walking on wet pasparum. So when they came to, uh, to maybe Buganda, they, were told, they, were, they would tell Buganda, we cannot walk in that thing. So if they came to work, they would not walk on that grass in the morning because it was wet. It is a romantic story. I cannot walk on this grass. It is going to make me sick. I won't be able to touch my, love, my lovely. I will not be able to walk. 
I will not be able to dance. I will not be able to, to, to dream. So we can write stories on anything in Africa, but the main thing is you have to write. We must write. We must inform our children. Our grandchildren will find the books about us. Nobody else is going to do it for us. It is very, very important. That's why I, I, um, I give up my time. I don't get paid to mentor any of the students at Makerere or anywhere else in the United States. I usually met a lot of black kids, United States and white kids, yes, um, so that they don't give up. They should never give up. They should continue with their schooling and so on, but at the same time, write about their experiences. Everything we do in life is an experience. Writing a thesis for your PhD is an experience. You could turn it into a romantic story and say, I wrote, I, I, you know, I went to study about mosquitoes because this and this and this and this happened to me. And it will, make, it will be a bestseller. Because most people don't know about mosquitoes. They don't know why they make us sick. And you write something and people will read it. It is, it's not, I don't think it is, it's not cool to go to a library and you find a book written by Mr. Johnson about mosquitoes and you live in a country that has terrible, so many mosquitoes yourself. So my, my lesson today or my message today is write, 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 and write for your children, for your grandchildren, and write for your country. Write everything. <laughs>